It's really an honor to be uh, at this 10th annual sort of milestone uh, Vail Hip Symposium. So I'm speaking about traumatic instability, and if you want a meaningful resource, this is just a chapter we finished in Shane Noe's book, re-edited along with Ashish and Brian Kelly and Chris Larson and Michael Lunick. But we talk about uh, sports-related instability. That's different than vehicular trauma. These are usually low-velocity injuries and not high-velocity injuries. We see posterior instability comes from macro trauma, and the reason we see these injuries is just a common mechanism of injury and contact and collision sports. When we think about anterior instability, more often that's micro trauma, and there are factors that set you up for instability, and one of the most troublesome uh, synergistic things is when you've got dysplasia. For people that are involved in sports with superphysiologic motion, that dysplasia is advantageous right up to the point things start to break down. It may have an increased McKibben's index, uh, reduced CE angle, increasing neck shaft angle, uh, s tabular index, et cetera. Now, in 2008, we presented our NFL experience on, on posterior hip instability. And basically, we found the diagnosis oftentimes really wasn't necessarily that obvious. Symptoms were not severely uh, incapacitating. Some athletes continued to play or at least tried to play after significant subluxation episodes. A lot of these we found were non-contact injuries. Posterior rim fractures were not uncommon, but didn't seem to adversely affect the income, uh, the outcome. Uh, but are easily over, but these rim fractures are a uh, Freudian slip there, I guess. But these rim fractures are easily overlooked because, at least in our stadium, the x-ray machine we have is the last one to be thrown out by the hospital, not the greatest x-ray machine. But even if you've got good quality x-rays, it's easy to overlook these rim fractures because you're just not thinking about it in these people that don't, aren't all that symptomatic. Uh, MRIs will oftentimes misinterpret a posterior rim fracture as a labral tear. Remember this bone is avascular, it's cortical bone, so there's no bony edema that you would expect to see with the fracture. A lot of these had MRI evidence of associated pre-existing pathology, which at the time we thought was probably just an incidental finding. Uh, I think we're probably definitely wrong on that observation. As far as our treatment strategy, we, we recommended early arthroscopic intervention only if there's a non-concentric reduction or entrapped fragments. Uh, generally, we would consider arthroscopy after they're through the acute, the acute phase of the injury after about three months. And I think one of the main reasons is at time zero, you don't really know what the fate is of that articular surface. Some of that articular surface may be doomed to fail, but may look grossly okay if you look in there early on. We found that a lot of these subsequently developed subchondral edema in the femoral head. Uh, it's just an indication of the impaction injury of the femoral head, and it's not a harbinger of poor results or early AVM. A reasonable expectation of return to football can be expected at 8 to 10 weeks in a lot of these. And from my perspective, I feel like the eventual outcome was probably determined by whatever happened at the moment of injury. And chances are, however you treat it from that point forward may not vastly influence what the outcome is going to be. Now, most of these do well, but some of them are destined to do poorly. And on the front end, it's very hard to predict, is this one of the many that's going to do well, or is this one of those that might go bad right before your eyes? So it obligates you to a thoughtful treatment strategy for all of them. Now, Aaron Kreitz took this to a new level. He took uh, our data, Brian Kelly's and Chris Larson, uh, looking at posterior instability, and he looked specifically at rim fractures just to have a homogeneous uh, patient population. 22 athletes, 91% returned to their previous level of sport. Half of these underwent arthroscopy, but none of them acutely. A small, only a small portion did not have some underlying FAI. And for those patients, they had the classic mechanism of injury that you think of, uh, axial loading of the flexed knee with the flexed internally rotated adducted hip. The vast majority had some pre-existing findings of FAI, and these are the ones that tended to have the non-contact injuries. Uh, just a couple of illustrative mechanisms, and these cases don't necessarily uh, have rim fractures. This was our starting quarterback who got hit by two 300-pound linemen. And you can see as he lands on his hip, he injures it. This little closer up view, and you'll see as he gets spun around, as he lands, classic mechanism, lands on his flexed knee, flexed hip. The hip is adducted and maximally internally rotated, and he injures his hip. <clears throat> And that's a classic example, but the hip can get injured a lot of ways. Again, that's a, a general non-contact mechanism. And as you watch this, you might not necessarily even notice what happens. But as we come back in slow motion, we'll start to see 
This is a typical non-contact deceleration loading of the flexed hip, which is probably a more common mechanism. And again, can result in a variety of, of symptoms from the hip joint. This is an illustrative example. This is a, a Division I collegiate defensive end who's had two subluxation episodes of his left hip a year apart, got tired of it, he's ready to get something done. You can see he's got a significant posterior wall sign, posterior uncoverage of the acetabulum, some cam morphology. On his MRI, he's got a posterior labral tear, but he's also got an anterior labral tear. On his CT images, he's got uh, acetabular retroversion. Looking at his 3D images, he's got substantial acetabular retroversion. You can make an argument, is this somebody who ought to have a reverse PAO? Well, he wasn't too keen on a reverse PAO, so we went in arthroscopically. Here's the posterior labral tear, and these we fix just like a bank heart tear in, in the shoulder. You can get good access from the posterior lateral portal. We put our anchors against the rim. Posterior lateral portal gives you a good shot right down the posterior rim. We'll pass the sutures. We'll loop them around, and we do try to create a little bit of a bolster effect. Uh, it's not necessarily important for recreating the labral seal, but in this case, we, we believe it may have some mechanical stability factors to the posterior aspect especially in this guy with significant posterior un under coverage. So we'll complete our repair, or bank heart repair of his posterior labrum. And then we'll look around the front, and here's this anterior labral damage, which is probably much more long-standing. This is from his impingement. We've repaired the labrum. So we fix the back, fix the front, go to the periphery. Here's his cam lesion, where it probably engaged against the anterior rim, levering the hip out the back. So he corrected his cam lesion, and he returned to collegiate football successfully. Now this example is a 25-year-old little girl who's a, a, an elite-level athlete who's becoming symptomatic with the right labral tear. Uh, she's got a mild cam lesion or CE angle 17. She might need a PAO, but she's trying to get ready for the Olympics, and a PAO is not in her future for being able to get ready for the Olympics. Here's her labral tear, so we, we sort of shopped it around, decided arthroscopy might be the way to go. We're looking in her hip, and here's her anterior labral tear. Now, for a gal with a little underlying dysplasia, that's a mighty hypoplastic labrum. She doesn't have much labrum. We just use simple loop sutures because if we tried to use a label-based fixation, I don't think we'd have had anything left. She had a partially disrupted ligamentum teres. We thermally decompressed it, trying to preserve the, the stable portion. Then we go to her periphery, we corrected her cam lesion. And I do not routinely close the capsule in every case, but this is a case that you would definitely want to close the capsule in. So we're coming in with our AccuPass, which is one useful way of putting in our looped uh, monofilament suture. And we'll come back with an arthro pierce, grab it through the superior part. We're using absorbable sutures, number two vicral sutures, pass those through. And then we'll time. And then we'll sequ sequentially go along and add in more. And in this case, we put in four number two vicral sutures and had a secure capsular closure. So following surgery, she did well, got back to her, her sport, competing at a high level, and she did very well right up until seven months when she stopped doing very well. She dislocated her hip in a competition, which got reduced, so she lands back on my doorstep, and we're scratching our head over this, and we're looking, okay, what all is involved with this case? Well, I could identify at least six things. Maybe y'all can identify six more. She's dysplastic. She had a hypoplastic labrum. She had a compromised ligamentum teres. You can question the integrity of her capsule. You can question whether she was maximally conditioned. This is a gal who went mostly uh, on talent and hadn't spent much time in the weight room, and she's participating in a sport that has uh, super physiologic forces. So which of those do you incorporate into your treatment? In our, in, that, in our strategy, again, she wasn't ready to give up on her goals. She didn't want a PAO. So we basically addressed two of these, her capsular issues as well as her conditioning. Here we are looking in the hip. Here's where the capsule's torn apart. We're sizing this up. So we went at this fairly acutely. We thought, well, should we just put her in a brace and let it heal? And that just didn't make sense to me. So we went in, we put 10 ultra braid sutures in, secured the capsule back down, put her in a hip spike, a brace for six weeks. And she recovered well, got back to her sport. Here's a, the fixation. The other thing we did is we, we put her on with a trainer that used to train Terrell Owens, who was a, a fitness freak. And, 
he got her back in the weight room and she was stronger than she'd ever been before. She's done well. She didn't make her, her Olympic dream, but she sends me a sweet little note every Christmas, so uh, it makes me smile, and I just hope I keep getting that note each year. <laughs> so to summarize for you, instability in the hip occurs on many different levels. There's certainly a spectrum we deal with between physiologic laxity and when does that break down into pathological instability. Uh, you have bony and soft tissue contributions to stability, just like you have uh, bony contributions that, that predispose you to instability. You have static and dynamic stabilizers, primary and secondary stabilizers with variable contributions, what roles the iliopsoas play, and also the exposure. What sort of things are these people and athletes doing? Are they pr participating in physiologic or super physiologic activities? So to me, symptomatic instability is really oftentimes multifactorial, and a multifactorial problem requires a multifaceted treatment strategy. You can't just think uh, uh, unilaterally. Thank you very much.